the pure unclouded brow and dreaming eyes of wonder, though time be fleet and I and thou are half a life asunder, thy loving smile will surely hail the love gift of a fairy tale. I have not seen thy sunny face nor heard thy silver laughter, no thought of me shall find a place in thy young life's hereafter. Enough that now thou wilt not fail to listen to my fairy tale. A tale begun in other days when summer suns were glowing, a simple chime that served to time the rhythm of our rowing, whose echoes live in memory yet, though envious years would say, forget. Come hearken then, ere voice of dread with bitter tidings laden shall summon to unwelcome bed a melancholy maiden. We are but older children, dear, who fret to find our bedtime near. Without the frost, the blinding snow, the storm wind's moody madness, within the firelight's ruddy glow and childhood's nest of gladness, the magic words shall hold thee fast, thou shalt not heed the raving blast. And though the shadow of a sigh may tremble through the story, for happy summer days gone by and vanished summer glory, it shall not touch with breath of veil the pleasance of our fairy tale. Chapter One, The Looking Glass House. Kitty. Can you play chess? Now don't smile, my dear. I'm asking you seriously. Because when we were playing just now, you watched just as if you understood it. And when I said check, you purred. Well, it was a nice check, Kitty. And really, I might have won if it hadn't been for that nasty knight that came wriggling down among my pieces. Kitty, dear, let's pretend and here I wish I could tell you half the things Alice used to say, beginning with her favourite phrase, let's pretend. Let's pretend that you're the Red Queen, Kitty. Do you know, I think if you sat up and folded your arms, you would look exactly like her. Now do try, there's a dear. And Alice got the Red Queen off the table and set it up before the kitten as a model for it to imitate. However, the thing didn't succeed. Principally, Alice said, because the kitten wouldn't fold its arms properly. So, to punish it, she held it up to the looking glass that it might see how sulky it was. And if you're not good directly, she added, I'll put you through into the looking glass house. How would you like that? Now, if you'll attend, Kitty, and not talk so much, I'll tell you all my ideas about looking glass house. First, there's the room you can see through the glass. That's just the same as our drawing room, only the things go the other way. You can just see a little peep of the passage in Looking Glass House if you leave the door of our drawing room wide open. And it's very like our passage as far as you can see, only you know it may be quite different on beyond. Oh, Kitty, how nice it would be if we could only get through into Looking Glass House. I'm sure it's got, oh, such beautiful things in it. Let's pretend there's a way of getting through it somehow, Kitty. Let's pretend the glass has got soft like gauze so that we can get through. Why, it's turning into a sort of mist now, I declare. It'll be easy enough to get through. She was up on the chimney piece while she said this, though she hardly knew how she got there. And certainly the glass was beginning to melt away, just like a bright silvery mist. In another moment, Alice was through the glass and had jumped lightly down into the looking glass room. Well, what fun it'll be when they see me through the glass in here and can't get at me. Then she began looking about and noticed that what could be seen from the old room was quite common and uninteresting, but that all the rest was as different as possible. For instance, the pictures on the wall next to the fire seemed to be all alive. And the very clock on the chimney piece, you know you can only see the back of it in the looking glass, had got the face of a little old man and grinned at her. The 
Lady, don't keep this room so tidy, as the other Alice thought to herself, as she noticed several of the chessmen down in the hearth among the cinders. But in another moment, with a little O oh of surprise, she was down on her hands and knees watching them. The chessmen were walking about, two and two. Here are the Red King and the Red Queen, Alice said in a whisper for fear of frightening them. And there are the White King and the White Queen sitting on the end of the shovel. And here are two castles walking arm in arm. I don't think they can hear me, she went on, as she put her head closer down. And I'm nearly sure they can't see me. I feel as if I were invisible. Here something began squeaking on the table and made Alice turn her head just in time to see one of the white palms roll over and begin kicking. She watched it with great curiosity to see what would happen next. It is the voice of my child, the White Queen cried out as she rushed past the king so violently that she knocked him over among the cinders. My precious Lily, my imperial kitten, and she began scrambling wildly up the side of the fender. Imperial fiddlesticks, said the king, rubbing his nose, which had been rather hurt by the fall. He had a right to be a little annoyed, for he was covered with ashes from head to foot. Alice was very anxious to be of use, and as the poor little Lily was nearly screaming herself into a fit, she hastily picked up the queen and set her upon the table by the side of her noisy little daughter. The queen gasped and sat down. The rapid journey through the air had quite taken away her breath, and for a minute or two she could do nothing but hug the little lily in silence. As soon as she recovered her breath a little, she called out to the white king, who was sitting sulkily among the ashes, Mind the volcano! What volcano, said the king, looking up anxiously into the fire, as if he thought that was the most likely place to find one. Blew me up, panted the queen, who was still a little out of breath. Mind you come up the regular way. Don't get blown up. <laughs> Alice watched the white king as he slowly struggled up from bar to bar, till at last she said, Why, you will be hours and hours getting into the table at that rate. I'd far better help you, hadn't I? But the king took no notice of the question. It was quite clear that he could neither hear her nor see her. So Alice picked him up very gently and lifted him across more slowly than she'd lifted the queen, that she mightn't take his breath away. But before she put him on the table, she thought she might as well dust him a little. He was so covered with ashes. She said afterwards that she had never seen in all her life such a face as the king made when he found himself held in the air by an invisible hand and being dusted. He was far too much astonished to cry out, but his eyes and his mouth went on getting larger and larger and rounder and rounder, till her hand shook so with laughing that she nearly let him drop upon the floor. Oh, please don't make such faces, my dear, she cried out, quite forgetting that the king couldn't hear her. You make me laugh so that I can hardly hold you. And don't keep your mouth so wide open. All the ashes will get into it. There, now I think you're tidy enough, she added, as she smoothed his hair and set him down very carefully upon the table near the queen. The king immediately fell flat on his back and lay perfectly still. And Alice was a little alarmed at what she had done and went round the room to see if she could find any water to throw over him. However, she could find nothing but a bottle of ink and when she got back with it, she found it recovered, and that he and the Queen were talking together in a frightened whisper, so low that Alice could scarcely hear what they had said. The King was saying, I assure you, my dear, I turned cold to the very end of my whiskers. To which the Queen replied, You haven't got any whiskers. The horror of that moment, the King went on, I shall never, never forget. You will, though, the Queen said, if you don't make a memorandum of it. Alice looked with great interest as the King took an enormous memorandum book out of his pocket and began writing. A sudden thought struck her, and she took hold of the end of the pencil, which came some way over his shoulder, and began writing for him. The poor King looked puzzled and unhappy, and struggled with the pencil for some time without saying anything. But Alice was too strong for him, and at last he panted out, my dear, 
I really must get a thinner pencil. I can't manage this one a bit. It writes all manner of things that I don't intend. There was a book lying near Alice on the table, and while she sat watching the White King, for she was still a little anxious about him and had the ink all ready to throw over him in case he fainted again, she turned over the leaves to find some part that she could read. For it's all in some language I don't know, she said to herself. She puzzled over this for some time, but at last a bright thought struck her. Why, it's a looking-glass book, of course, and if I hold it up to a glass, the words will all go the right way again. This was the poem that Alice read. Jabberwocky T'was brillig, and the slithy toves did gyre and gimble in the wave. All mimsy were the borogoves, and the mome wraths outgrave. Beware the jabberwock, my son, the jaws that bite, the claws that catch. Beware the jubjub bird, and shun the frumious bandersnatch. He took his vorpal sword in hand, long time the manxome foe he sought. So rested he by the tum-tum tree, and stood a while in thought. And as in uffish thought he stood, the jabberwock with eyes of flame came whiffling through the tulgy wood, and burbled as it came. One, two, one, two, and through and through the vorpal blade went snicker-snack. He left it dead, and with its head he went galumphing back. And hast thou slain the jabberwock? Come to my arms, my beamish boy. O oh, frabjous day, caloo, calay, he chortled at his joy. Twas brillig, and the slithy toves did gyre and gimble in the wave. All mimsy were the borogoves. And the mome wraths outgrave. It seems very pretty, she said when she'd finished it, but it's rather hard to understand. You see, she didn't like to confess even to herself that she couldn't make it out at all. Somehow it seems to fill my head with ideas, only I don't exactly know what they are. But oh, thought Alice, suddenly jumping up, if I don't make haste, I shall have to go back through the looking glass before I've seen what the rest of the house is like. Let's have a look at the garden first. She was out of the room in a moment and ran downstairs, or at least it wasn't exactly running, but a new invention for getting downstairs quickly and easily, as Alice said to herself. She just kept the tips of her fingers on the handrail and floated gently down without even touching the stairs with her feet. Then she floated on through the hall and would have gone straight out at the door in the same way if she hadn't caught hold of the doorpost. She was getting a little giddy with so much floating in the air and was rather glad to find herself walking again in the natural way. <laughs> I should see the garden far better, said Alice to herself, if I could get to the top of that hill. And here's a path that leads straight to it. But how curiously it twists. It's more like a corkscrew than a path. Well, this turn goes to the hill, I suppose. No, it doesn't. This goes straight back to the house. Well, then I'll try it the other way. And so she did, wandering up and down and trying turn after turn but always coming back to the house, do what she could. 
Indeed, once, when she turned a corner rather more quickly than usual, she ran against it before she could stop herself. Oh, it's too bad, she cried. I never saw such a house for getting in the way. Never. However, there was the hill full in sight, so there was nothing to be done but start again. This time she came upon a large flower bed with a border of daisies and a willow tree growing in the middle. Oh, Tiger Lily, said Alice, addressing herself to one that was waving gracefully about in the wind. I wish you could talk. We can talk, said the Tiger Lily, when there's anybody worth talking to. Alice was so astonished she couldn't speak for a minute. It seemed quite to take her breath away. At length, as the Tiger Lily only went on waving about, she spoke again in a timid voice, almost in a whisper, and can as well as you can, said the tiger lily, and a great deal louder. It isn't manners for us to begin, you know, said the rose, and I really was wondering when you'd speak. Said I to myself, her face has got some sense in it, though it's not a clever one. Still, you're the right colour, and that goes a long way. I don't care about the colour, said the tiger lily remarked. If only her petals curled up a little more, she'd be all right. Alice didn't like being criticised. So she began asking questions. How is it you can all talk so nicely, Alice said. I've been in many gardens before, but none of the flowers could talk. Put your hand down and feel the ground, said the tiger lily, then you'll know why. Alice did so. It's very hard, she said, but I don't see what that has to do with it. In most gardens, the tiger lily said, they make the beds too soft, so that the flowers are always asleep. This sounded a very good reason, and Alice was quite pleased to know it. I never thought of that before, she said. It's my opinion you never think at all, the rose said in rather a severe tone. I never thought anyone would look stupider, the violet said, so suddenly that Alice quite jumped, for it hadn't spoken before. Hold your tongue, said the tiger lily, as if you ever saw anybody. You keep your head under the leaves and snore away there till you know no more of what's going on in the world than if you were a bud. Are there any more people in the garden like me? Alice said, not choosing to notice the rose's last remark. There's one other flower in the garden that can move about like you, said the rose, but she's more bushy than you are. Is she like me? Alice asked eagerly, for the thought crossed her mind. There's another little girl in the garden somewhere. Well, she is the same awkward shape as you, the rose said, but, but she's redder, and her petals are shorter, I think. Her petals are done up close, almost like a dahlia, the tiger lily interrupted, not tumbled about anyhow like yours. Yeah, but that's not your fault, the rose added kindly. You're beginning to fade, you know, and then one can't help one's petals getting a little untidy. Alice didn't like this idea at all, so to change the subject, she asked, does she ever come out here? I dare say you'll see her soon, said the rose. She's one of the thorny kind. Oh, where does she wear the thorns? Alice asked with some curiosity. Well, why all round her head, of course, the rose replied. I was wondering you hadn't got some too. I thought it was the regular rule. She's coming, cried the larkspur. I hear her footstep thump, thump along the gravel walk. Alice looked round eagerly and found that it was the Red Queen. She's grown a good deal, was her first remark. She had indeed. When Alice first found her in the ashes, she'd been only three inches high, and here she was, half a head taller than Alice herself. It's the fresh air that does it, said the Rose. Wonderfully fine air it is out here. <laughs> I think I'll go and meet her, said Alice, for though the flowers were very interesting, she felt that it would be far grander to have a talk with a real queen. You can't possibly do that, said the Rosa. I should advise you to walk the other way. That sounded nonsense to Alice, so she said nothing, but set off at once towards the Red Queen. To her surprise, she lost sight of her in a moment and found herself walking in at the front door again. A little provoked, she drew back, and after looking everywhere for the Queen, whom she spied out at last a long way off, she thought she would try the plan this time of walking in the opposite direction. It succeeded beautifully. She'd not been walking a minute 
before she found herself face to face with the Red Queen and full in sight of the hill she'd been so long aiming at. Where do you come from, said the Red Queen, and where are you going? Look up, speak nicely, and don't twiddle your fingers all the time. Alice attended to all these directions and explained as well as she could that she'd lost her way. I don't know what you mean by your way, said the Queen. All the ways about here belong to me. But why did you come here at all, she added in a kinder tone. Curtsy while you're thinking what to say. It saves time. Alice wondered a little at this, but she was too much in awe of the Queen to disbelieve it. It's time for you to answer now, the Queen said, looking at her watch. Open your mouth a little wider when you speak. And always say, Your Majesty. I only wanted to see what the garden was like, Your Majesty. That's right, said the Queen, patting her on the head, which Alice didn't like at all. Though when you say garden, I've seen gardens compared with which this would be a wilderness. Alice didn't dare to argue the point, but went on, and I thought I'd try and find my way to the top of that hill. When you say hill, the queen interrupted, I could show you hills in comparison with which you could call that a valley. No, I shouldn't, said Alice, surprised into contradicting her at last. A hill can't be a valley, you know. That would be nonsense. The red queen shook her head. You may call it nonsense if you like, but I've heard nonsense compared with which that would be as sensible as a dictionary. Alice curtsied again, as she was afraid from the Queen's tone she was a little offended, and they walked on in silence till they got to the top of the little hill. For some minutes Alice stood without speaking, looking out in all directions over the country, and a most curious country it was. There were a number of little brooks running across from side to side, and the ground between was divided up into squares by a number of hedges that reached from brook to brook. I declare it's marked out just like a large chessboard, Alice said at last. There ought to be some men moving about somewhere, and so there are, she added in a tone of delight, and her heart began to beat quick with excitement as she went on. How I wish I was one of them. I wouldn't mind being a pawn, if only I might join, though of course I should like to be a queen best. She glanced rather shyly at the real queen, she said this, but her companion only smiled pleasantly and said, That's easily managed. You can be the White Queen's pawn, if you like, as Lily's too young to play. And you're in the second square to begin with. When you get into the eighth square, you'll be a queen. Just at this moment, somehow or other, they began to run. The most curious part of the thing was that the trees and the other things round them never changed their places at all. However fast they went, they never seemed to pass anything. I wonder if all the things move along with us, thought poor puzzled Alice. And the Queen seemed to guess her thoughts, for she cried, Faster! Don't try to talk! Not that Alice had any idea of doing that. She felt as if she'd never be able to talk again. She was getting so out of breath. And still the Queen cried, Faster! Faster! And dragged her along. Oh, oh, are we nearly there? Alice managed to pant out at last. Nearly there, the Queen repeated. Why, we passed it ten minutes ago. Faster! And they ran on for a time in silence, with the wind whistling in Alice's ears and almost blowing her hair off her head, she fancied. Now, now, cried the Queen. Faster, faster! And they went so fast that at last they seemed to skim through the air, hardly touching the ground with their feet, till suddenly, just as Alice was getting quite exhausted, they stopped, and she found herself sitting on the ground, breathless and giddy. The Queen propped her up against a tree, and said kindly, You may rest a little now. Alice looked round in great surprise. Why, I do believe we've been under this tree all the time. Everything's just as it was. Of course it is, said the Queen. What would you have it? Well, in our country, said Alice, still panting a little, you generally get to somewhere else if you ran very fast for a long time, as we've been doing. A slow sort of country, said the Queen. Now here, you see, it takes all the running you can do to keep in the same place. 
If you want to get somewhere else, you must run at least twice as fast as that. Oh, I'd rather not try, please, said Alice. I, I'm quite content to stay here. Uh, only I am so hot and thirsty. I know what you'd like, the Queen said good-naturedly, taking a little box out of her pocket. Have a biscuit. Alice thought it would not be civil to say no, though it wasn't at all what she wanted. So she took it and ate it as well as she could, and it was very dry, and she thought she'd never been so nearly choked in all of her life. While you're refreshing yourself, said the Queen, I'll just take the measurements. And she took a ribbon out of her pocket, marked in inches, and began measuring out the ground and sticking little pegs in here and there. At the end of two yards, she said, putting in a peg to mark the distance, I shall give you your directions. Have another biscuit. No, thank you, said Alice. One's quite enough. First quenched, I hope, said the Queen. Alice didn't know what to say to this, but luckily the Queen did not wait for an answer, but went on. At the end of three yards, I shall repeat them, for fear of your forgetting them. At the end of four, I shall say goodbye, and at the end of five, I shall go. She had got all the pegs put in by this time, and Alice looked on with great interest as she returned to the tree and then began slowly walking down the row. At the two-yard peg, she faced round and said, A pawn goes two squares in its first move, so you'll go very quickly through the third square, and you'll find yourself in the fourth square in no time. Well, that square belongs to Tweedledum and Tweedledee. The fifth is mostly water. The sixth belongs to Humpty Dumpty, but you make no remark. I, I, I didn't know I had to make one. Just then, Alice faltered out. You should have said, the Queen went on in a tone of grave reproof. It's extremely kind of you to tell me all this. However, we'll suppose it's said. The seventh square is all forest. However, one of the knights will show you the way. And in the eighth square, we shall be queens together. And it's all feasting and fun. Alice got up and curtsied and sat down again. <laughs> At the next peg, the Queen turned again and said, Speak in French when you can't think of the English for a thing. Turn out your toes as you walk, and remember who you are. She did not wait for Alice to curtsy this time, but walked on quickly to the next peg, where she turned to say goodbye, and then hurried on for the last. How it happened, Alice never knew, but exactly as she came to the last peg, she was gone. Whether she vanished into the air or ran quickly into the wood, and she can run very fast, thought Alice, there was no way of guessing, but she was gone, and Alice began to remember that she was a pawn and that it would soon be time to move. Of course, the first thing to do was to make a grand survey of the country she was going to travel through. So with this excuse, she ran down the hill and jumped over the first of the six little brooks. She very soon came to an open field with a wood on the other side of it. It looked much darker than the last wood, and Alice felt a little timid about going into it. However, on second thoughts, she made up her mind to go on. For I certainly won't go back, she thought to herself, and this was the only way to the eighth square. And now, which of these finger posts ought I to follow, I wonder? It was not a difficult question to answer, as there was only one road, and the finger posts both pointed along it. I'll settle it, Alice said to herself, when the road divides and they point different ways. But this did not seem likely to happen. She went on and on a long way, but wherever the road divided, there were sure to be two finger posts pointing the same way, one marked to Tweedledum's house and the other to the house of Tweedledee. I do believe, said Alice at last, that they live in the same house. I never thought of that before. But I can't stay there long. I'll just call and say how do you do and ask them the way out of the wood. If I could only get to the eighth square before it gets dark. So she wandered on, talking to herself as she went, till on turning a sharp corner, she came upon two fat little men, so suddenly that she could not help starting back. But in another moment she recovered herself, feeling sure that they must be... Chapter 3, Tweedledum and Tweedledee.
They were standing under a tree, each with an arm round the other's neck, and Alice knew which was which in a moment, because one of them had dumb embroidered on his collar, and the other D. I suppose they've each got Tweedle round at the back of the collar, she said to herself. They stood so still, she quite forgot they were alive, and she was just looking round to see if the word Tweedle was written at the back of each collar, when she was startled by a voice coming from the one marked dumb. If you think we are waxworks, he said, you ought to pay, you know. Waxworks weren't made to be looked at for nothing, no how. Contrarywise, added the one marked D, if you think we're alive, you ought to speak. I'm sure I'm very sorry, was all Alice could say, for the words of the old song kept ringing through her head like the ticking of a clock, and she could hardly help saying them out loud. Tweedledum and Tweedledee agreed to have a battle, for Tweedledum said Tweedledee had spoilt his nice new rattle. Just then flew down a monstrous crow, as black as a tar barrel, which frightened both the heroes so they quite forgot their quarrel. I know what you're thinking about, said Tweedledum, but it isn't so, no how. Contrarywise, continued Tweedledee, if it was so, it might be, and if it were so, it would be, and as it isn't, it ain't. That's logic. I was thinking, Alice said very politely, which is the best way out of this wood? It's getting so dark. Would you tell me, please? But the fat little men only looked at each other and grinned. They looked so exactly like a couple of great schoolboys that Alice couldn't help pointing her finger at Tweedledum and saying, First boy! No how! Tweedledum cried out briskly and instantly shut his mouth up again with a snap. Next boy! said Alice, passing on to Tweedledee, though she felt quite certain he would only shout out, Contrarywise! and so he did. <laughs> You've begun wrong! cried Tweedledum. The first thing in a visit is to say how do you do and shake hands! And here the two brothers gave each other a hug, and then they held out the two hands that were free to shake hands with her. Alice did not like shaking hands with either of them first, for fear of hurting the other one's feelings. So as the best way out of the difficulty, she took hold of both hands at once. The next moment they were dancing round in a ring. This seemed quite natural, she remembered afterwards, and she was not even surprised to hear music playing. It seemed to come from the tree under which they were dancing, and it was done, as well as she could make out, by the branches rubbing one across the other, like fiddles and fiddlesticks. The other two dancers were fat and very soon out of breath. Uh, uh, four times round is quite enough for one dance, Tweedledum panted out, and they left off dancing as suddenly as they'd begun. The music stopped at the same moment. Then they let go of Alice's hands and stood looking at her for a minute. There was a rather awkward pause, as Alice didn't know how to begin a conversation with people she'd just been dancing with. <laughs> it would never do to say, how do you do now, she said to herself. We seem to have got beyond that somehow. I hope you're not much tired, she said at last. No how, and thank you very much for asking, said Tweedledum. So much obliged, added Tweedledee. You like poetry? Yes, pretty well. Some poetry, Alice said doubtfully. Would you tell me which road leads out of the wood? What shall I repeat to her, said Tweedledee, looking round at Tweedledum with great solemn eyes and not noticing Alice's question. The walrus and the carpenter is the longest, Tweedledum replied, giving his brother an affectionate hug. Tweedledee began instantly. The sun was shining. Here Alice ventured to interrupt. If it's very long, she said, as politely as she could, would you tell me first which road? Tweedledee smiled gently and began again. The sun was shining on the sea, shining with all his might. He did his very best to make the billows smooth and bright. And this was odd, because it was the middle of the night. The moon was shining sulkily because she thought the sun had got no business to be there after the day was done. It's very rude of him, she said, to come and spoil the fun. 
The sea was wet as wet could be, the sands were dry as dry. You could not see a cloud because no cloud was in the sky. No birds were flying overhead, there were no birds to fly. The walrus and the carpenter were walking close at hand. They wept like anything to see such quantities of sand. If this were only cleared away, they said it would be grand. If seven maids with seven mops swept it for half a year, do you suppose the walrus said that they could get it clear? I doubt it, said the carpenter, and shed a bitter tear. O oh, oysters, come and walk with us, the walrus did beseech. A pleasant walk, a pleasant talk along the briny beach. We cannot do with more than four to give a hand to each. The eldest oyster looked at him, and never a word he said. The eldest oyster winked his eye and shook his heavy head, meaning to say he did not choose to leave the oyster bed. But four young oysters hurried up, all eager for the treat. Their coats were brushed, their faces washed, their shoes were clean and neat. And this was odd, because, you know, they hadn't any feet. <laughs> Four other oysters followed them, and yet another four, and thick and fast they came at last, and more and more and more, all hopping through the frothy waves and scrambling to the shore. The walrus and the carpenter walked on a mile or so, and then they rested on a rock conveniently low, and all the little oysters stood and waited in a row. The time has come, the walrus said, to talk of many things, of shoes and ships and sealing wax, of cabbages and kings, and why the sea is boiling hot and whether pigs have wings. But wait a bit, the oysters cried, before we have our chat, for some of us are out of breath and all of us are fat. No hurry, said the carpenter. They thanked him much for that. A loaf of bread, the walrus said, is what we chiefly need. Pepper and vinegar besides are very good indeed. Now, if you're ready, oysters, dear, we can begin to feed. But not on us, the oysters cried, turning a little blue. After such kindness, that would be a dismal thing to do. The night is fine, the walrus said. Do you admire the view? It was so kind of you to come, and you are very nice. The carpenter said nothing but cut us another slice. I wish you were not quite so deaf. I had to ask you twice. It seems a shame, the walrus said, to play them such a trick. After we brought them out so far and make them trot so quick, the carpenter said nothing but the butter spread too thick. I weep for you, the walrus said. I deeply sympathize. With sobs and tears, he sorted out those of the largest size, holding his pocket handkerchief before his streaming eyes. Oh, oyster, said the carpenter, you had a pleasant run. Shall we be trotting home again? But answer came there none. And this was scarcely odd because they'd eaten everyone. I like the walrus best, said Alice, because, you see, he was a little sorry for the poor oysters. He ate more than the carpenter, though, said Tweedledee. You see, he held his handkerchief in front so that the carpenter couldn't count how many he took. Contrary-wise, that was mean, Alice said indignantly. And I like the carpenter best if he didn't eat so many as the walrus. But he ate as many as he could get, said Tweedledum. This was a puzzler. After a pause, Alice began, Well, they were both very unpleasant characters. Here she checked herself in some alarm at hearing something that sounded to her like the puffing of a large steam engine in the wood near them, though she feared it was more likely to be a wild beast. 
Are there any lions or tigers about here? she asked timidly. It's only the Red King snoring, said Tweedledee. Come and look at him, the brothers cried, and they each took one of Alice's hands and led her up to where the king was sleeping. Isn't he a lovely sight, said Tweedledum. Alice couldn't honestly say that he was. He had a tall red nightcap on with a tassel, and he was lying crumpled up in a sort of untidy heap and snoring loud. Fit to snore his head off, as Tweedledum remarked. I'm afraid you'll catch cold lying on the damp grass, said Alice, who was a very thoughtful little girl. He's dreaming now, said Tweedledee, and what do you think he's dreaming about? Alice said, nobody can guess that. Why, about you, Tweedledee exclaimed, clapping his hands triumphantly. And if he left off dreaming about you, where do you suppose you'd be? Where I am now, of course, said Alice. Not you, Tweedledee retorted contemptuously. You'd be nowhere. Why, you're only a sort of thing in his dream. If that there king was to wake at it, Tweedledum, you'd go out bang, just like a candle. I shouldn't, Alice exclaimed indignantly. Besides, if I'm only a sort of thing in his dream, what are you, I should like to know? Ditto, cried Tweedledum. Ditto, ditto, cried Tweedledee. He shouted this so loud that Alice couldn't help saying, hush. You will be waking him, I'm afraid, if you make so much noise. Well, it's no use your talking about waking him, said Tweedledum, when you're only one of the things in his dream. You know very well you're not real. I am real, said Alice, and began to cry. You won't make yourself a bit realer by crying, Tweedledee remarked. There's nothing to cry about. If I wasn't real, Alice said, half laughing through her tears, it all seemed so ridiculous, I shouldn't be able to cry. I hope you don't suppose those are real tears, Tweedledum interrupted in a tone of great contempt. I know they're talking nonsense, Alice thought to herself, and it's foolish to cry about it. So she brushed away her tears and went on as cheerfully as she could. At any rate, I'd better be getting out of the wood, for really it's coming on very dark. Do you think it's going to rain? Tweedledum spread a large umbrella over himself and his brother and looked up into it. No, I don't think it is, he said. At least, not under here. No how. But it may rain outside. It may, if it chooses, said Tweedledee. We've no objection, contrarywise. Selfish things, thought Alice. And she was just going to say good night and leave them when Tweedledum sprang out from under the umbrella and seized her by the wrist. Do you see that, he said, in a voice choking with passion, and his eyes grew large and yellow all in a moment as he pointed with a trembling finger at a small white thing lying under the tree. It's only a rattle, Alice said, after a careful examination of the little white thing. Not a rattlesnake, you know, she added hastily, thinking he was frightened. Only an old rattle, quite old and broken. I knew it was, cried Tweedledum, beginning to stamp about wildly and tear his hair. It's spoilt, of course. Here he looked at Tweedledee, who immediately sat down on the ground and tried to hide himself under the umbrella. But Alice laid her hand upon his arm and said in a soothing tone, You needn't be so angry about an old rattle. But it isn't old, Tweedledum cried in a greater fury than ever. It's new, I tell you. I bought it yesterday, my nice new rattle. And his voice rose to a perfect scream. All this time, Tweedledee was trying his best to fold up the umbrella with himself in it, which was such an extraordinary thing to do that it quite took off Alice's attention from the angry brother. But he couldn't quite succeed and it ended in his rolling over, bundled up in the umbrella with only his head out. And there he lay, opening and shutting his mouth and his large eyes, looking more like a fish than anything else, Alice thought. Of course you agree to have a battle, Tweedledum said in a calmer tone. I suppose so, the other sulkily replied as he crawled out of the umbrella. Only she must help us to dress up, you know. 
So the two brothers went off hand in hand into the wood and returned in a minute with their arms full of things such as bolsters, blankets, hearth rugs, tablecloths, dish covers and coal scuttles. I hope you're a good hand at pinning and tying strings, Tweedledum remarked. Every one of these things has got to go on somehow or other. Alice said afterwards she'd never seen such a fuss made about anything in all her life. The way those two bustled about and the quantity of things they put on, and the trouble they gave her in tying strings and fastening buttons. Really, they'll be more like bundles of old clothes than anything else. By the time they're ready, she said to herself, as she arranged a bolster around the neck of Tweedledee to keep his head from being cut off, as he said. You know, he added very gravely, it's one of the most serious things that can possibly happen to one in a battle to get one's head cut off. Alice laughed loud, but managed to turn it into a cough for fear of hurting his feelings. Do I look very pale, said Tweedledum, coming up to have his helmet tied on. He called it a helmet, though it certainly looked much more like a saucepan. Well, yes, a little, Alice replied gently. I'm very brave, generally, he went on in a low voice. Only today I happen to have a headache. And I've got a toothache, said Tweedledee, who had overheard the remark. I'm far worse than you. Then you'd better not fight today, said Alice, thinking it a good opportunity to make peace. We must have a bit of a fight, but I don't care about going on long, said Tweedledum. What's the time now? Tweedledee looked at his watch and said, half past four. Let's fight till six and then have dinner, said Tweedledum. Very well, the other said, rather sadly. And she can watch us. Only you'd better not come very close, he added. I generally hit everything I can see when I get really excited. And I hit everything within reach, cried Tweedledum, whether I can see it or not. Alice laughed. You must hit the trees pretty often, I should think, she said. Tweedledum looked round him with a satisfied smile. I don't suppose, he said, there'll be a tree left standing for ever so far round by the time we've finished. And all about a rattle, said Alice, still hoping to make them a little ashamed of fighting for such a trifle. I shouldn't have minded it so much, said Tweedledum, if it hadn't been a new one. Oh, I wish the monstrous crow would come, thought Alice. There's only one sword, you know, Tweedledum said to his brother. But you can have the umbrella. It's quite as sharp. Only we must begin quick. It's getting as dark as it can. And darker, said Tweedledee. It was getting dark so suddenly that Alice thought there must be a thunderstorm coming on. What a thick black cloud that is, she said. And how fast it comes. Why, I do believe it's got wings. It's the crow, Tweedledum cried out in a shrill voice of alarm. And the two brothers took to their heels and were out of sight in a moment. Alice ran a little way into the wood and stopped under a large tree. It can never get at me here, she thought. It's far too large to squeeze itself in among the trees, but I wish it wouldn't flap its wings so. It makes quite a hurricane in the wood. Here's somebody's shawl being blown away.
water. She caught the shawl as she spoke and looked about for the owner. In another moment, the white queen came running wildly through the wood with both arms stretched out wide as if she were flying and Alice very civilly went to meet her with the shawl. I'm very glad I happened to be in the way, Alice said, as she helped her to put on her shawl again. The White Queen only looked at her in a helpless, frightened sort of way and kept repeating something in a whisper to herself that sounded like bread and butter, bread and butter. And Alice felt that if there was to be any conversation at all, she must manage it herself. So she began rather timidly, Am I addressing the White Queen? Well, yes, if you call that addressing, the Queen said. It isn't my notion of the thing at all. Alice thought it would never do to have an argument at the very beginning of their conversation. So she smiled and said, If your Majesty will only tell me the right way to begin, I'll do it as well as I can. But I don't want it done at all, groaned the poor Queen. I've been addressing myself for the last two hours. It would have been all the better, as it seemed to Alice, if only she'd got someone else to dress her. She was so dreadfully untidy. Every single thing's crooked, Alice thought to herself, and she's all over pins. May I put your shawl a little more straight for you, she added aloud. I don't know what's the matter with it, the Queen said in a melancholy voice. It's out of temper, I think. I've pinned it here and I've pinned it there, but there's no pleasing it. It can't go straight, you know, if you pin it all on one side, Alice said, as she gently put it right for her. And dear me, what a state your hair's in. The hairbrush has got entangled in it, the Queen said with a sigh, and I lost the comb yesterday. Alice carefully released the brush and did her best to get the hair into order. Come, you look rather better now, she said, after altering most of the pins, but really you should have a lady's maid. I'm sure I'll take you with pleasure, the Queen said. Tuppence a week and jam every other day. Alice couldn't help laughing as she said, I don't want you to hire me, and I don't care for jam. It's very good jam, said the Queen. Well, I don't want any today, at any rate. You couldn't have it if you did want it, the Queen said. The rule is jam tomorrow and jam yesterday, but never jam today. But it must sometimes come to jam today, Alice objected. No, it can't, said the Queen. It's jam every other day. Today isn't any other day, you know. I don't understand you, said Alice. It's dreadfully confusing. That's the effect of living backwards, the Queen said kindly. It always makes one a little giddy at first. Living backwards, Alice repeated in great astonishment. I never heard of such a thing. But there's one great advantage in it that one's memory works both ways. I'm sure mine only works one way, Alice remarked. I can't remember things before they happen. <laughs> it's a poor sort of memory that only works backwards, the Queen remarked. Well, what sort of things do you remember best, Alice ventured to ask. Oh, things that happen the week after next, the Queen replied in a careless tone. For instance, now, she went on, sticking a large piece of plaster on her finger as she spoke, there's the king's messenger. He's in prison now, being punished, and the trial doesn't even begin till next Wednesday, and of course the crime comes last of all. Suppose he never commits the crime, said Alice. That would be all the better, wouldn't it, the queen said, as she bound the plaster round her finger with a bit of ribbon. Alice felt there was no denying that. Of course it would be all the better, she said, but it wouldn't be all the better his being punished. You're wrong there, at any rate, said the Queen. Were you ever punished? Only for faults, said Alice. And you were all the better for it, I know, the Queen said triumphantly. Yes, but then I had done the things I was punished for, said Alice. That makes all the difference. But if you hadn't done them, the Queen said, that would have been better still, better and better and better, better. Her voice went higher with each better till it got quite to a squeak at last. Alice was just beginning to say, there's a mistake somewhere, when the Queen began screaming so loud that she had to leave the sentence unfinished. Oh, 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 shouted the Queen, shaking her hand about as if she wanted to shake it off. My finger's bleeding! Oh, 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 oh! 
Her screams were so exactly like the whistle of a steam engine that Alice had to hold both her hands over her ears. What is the matter, she said, as soon as there was a chance of making herself heard. Have you pricked your finger? I haven't pricked it yet, the queen said, but I soon shall. Oh, oh, oh! When do you expect to do it, Alice asked, feeling very much inclined to laugh. When I fasten my shawl again, the poor queen groaned out, the brooch will come undone directly. Oh, oh! As she said the words, the brooch flew open, and the queen clutched wildly at it and tried to clasp it again. Take care, cried Alice, you're holding it all crooked. And she caught at the brooch, but it was too late. The pin had slipped and the queen had pricked her finger. That accounts for the bleeding, you see, she said to Alice with a smile. Now you understand the way things happen here. But why don't you scream now, Alice asked, holding her hands ready to put over her ears again. Why, I've done all the screaming already, said the queen. What would be the good of having it all over again? <laughs> By this time it was getting light. The crow must have flown away, I think, said Alice. I'm so glad it's gone. I thought it was the night coming on. I wish I could manage to be glad, the queen said. Only I can never remember the rule. You must be very happy living in this wood and being glad whatever you like. Only it's so very lonely here, Alice said in a melancholy voice. And at the thought of her loneliness, two large tears came rolling down her cheeks. Oh, don't go on like that, cried the poor queen, wringing her hands in despair. Consider what a great gal you are. Consider what a long way you've come today. Consider what a clock it is. Consider anything, only don't cry. Alice could not help laughing at this, even in the midst of her tears. Can you keep from crying by considering things, she asked. That's the way it's done, the queen said, with great decision. Nobody can do two things at once, you know. Now let's consider your age to begin with. Uh, how old are you? I'm seven and a half, exactly. You needn't say exactly, the queen remarked. I can believe it without that. Now I'll give you something to believe. I'm just one hundred and one, five months and a day. I can't believe that, said Alice. Can't you, the queen said in a pitying tone. Try again. Draw a long breath and shut your eyes. Alice laughed. There's no use trying, she said. One can't believe impossible things. I dare say you haven't had much practice, said the Queen. When I was your age, I always did it for half an hour a day. Why, sometimes I've believed as many as six impossible things before breakfast. Oh, there goes that shawl again. The brooch had come undone as she spoke, and a sudden gust of wind blew her shawl across a little brook. The queen spread out her arms again and went flying after it, and this time succeeded in catching it for herself. I've got it, she cried in a triumphant tone. Now you shall see me pin it on again, all by myself. <laughs> then I hope your finger is better now, Alice said very politely, as she crossed the little brook after the queen. Oh, much better, said the queen, her voice rising into a squeak as she went on. Much better, 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 better. The last word ended in a long bleat, so like a sheep that Alice quite started. She looked at the queen, who seemed to have suddenly wrapped herself up in wool. Alice rubbed her eyes and looked again. She couldn't make out what had happened at all. Was she in a shop? And was that really... Was it really a sheep that was sitting on the other side of the counter? Rub as she would, she could make nothing more of it. She was in a little dark shop, leaning with her elbows on the counter, and opposite to her was an old sheep, sitting in an armchair, knitting, and every now and then leaving off to look at her through a large pair of spectacles. What is it you want to buy? the sheep said at last, looking up for a moment from her knitting. I don't quite know yet, Alice said very gently. I should like to look all round me first, if I might. You may look in front of you and on both sides, if you like, said the sheep, but you can't look all round you unless you've got eyes at the back of your head. <laughs> but these, as it happened, Alice had not got, so she contented herself with turning round, looking at the shelves as she came to them. The shop seemed to be full of all manner of curious things, 
But the oddest part of it all was that whenever she looked hard at any shelf to make out exactly what it had on it, that particular shelf was always quite empty, though the others around it were crowded as full as they could hold. Things flow about so here, she said at last in a plaintive tone, after she'd spent a minute or so in vainly pursuing a large bright thing that looked sometimes like a doll and sometimes like a workbox, and was always on the shelf next above the one she was looking at. And this one is the most provoking of all, she said, and I'll tell you what, she added, as a sudden thought struck her, I'll follow it up to the very top shelf of all. I'll puzzle it to go through the ceiling, I expect. But even this plan failed. The thing went through the ceiling as quietly as possible, as if it were quite used to it. What is it you want to buy, the sheep said again. I should like to buy an egg, please, Alice said timidly. How do you sell them? Five pence farthing for one, tuppence for two, the sheep replied. Then two are cheaper than one, Alice said in a surprised tone, taking out her purse. Only you must eat them both if you buy two, said the sheep. Then I'll have one, please, said Alice, as she put the money down on the counter, for she thought to herself, they mightn't be at all nice, you know. The sheep took the money and put it away in a box. Then she said, I never put things into people's hands. That would never do. You must get it for yourself. And so saying, she went off to the other end of the shop and set the egg upright on a shelf. I wonder why it wouldn't do, thought Alice, as she groped her way among the tables and chairs, for the shop was very dark towards the end. The egg seems to get further away the more I walk towards it. Let me see, is, is this a chair? Why, it's got branches, I declare. How very odd to find trees growing here. And actually, here's a little brook. Well, this is the queerest shop I ever saw. So she went on, wondering more and more at every step, as everything turned into a tree the moment she came up to it, and she quite expected the egg to do the same. <laughs> Humpty Dumpty. However, the egg only got larger and larger and more and more human. When she'd come within a few yards of it, she saw it had eyes and a nose and mouth. And when she'd come close to it, she saw clearly that it was Humpty Dumpty himself. It can't be anybody else, she said to herself. I'm as certain of it as if his name were written all over his face. It might have been written a hundred times easily on that enormous face. 
Humpty Dumpty was sitting with his legs crossed like a Turk on the top of a high wall, such a narrow one that Alice quite wondered how he could keep his balance. And as his eyes were steadily fixed in the opposite direction, and he didn't take the least notice of her, she thought he must be a stuffed figure. And how exactly like an egg he is, she said aloud, standing with her hands ready to catch him, for she was every moment expecting him to fall. It's very provoking, Humpty Dumpty said after a long silence, looking away from Alice as he spoke, to be called an egg, very. I said you looked like an egg, sir, Alice gently explained, and some eggs are very pretty, you know, she said, hoping to turn her remark into a sort of compliment. Some people, said Humpty Dumpty, looking away from her as usual, have no more sense than a baby. Alice didn't know what to say to this. It wasn't at all like conversation, she thought, as he never said anything to her. In fact, his last remark was evidently addressed to a tree. So she stood and softly repeated to herself, Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall, Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty Dumpty in his place again. That last line is much too long for the poetry, she added, almost out loud, forgetting that Humpty Dumpty would hear her. Don't stand chattering to yourself like that, Humpty Dumpty said, looking at her for the first time, but tell me your name and your business. My name is Alice, but it's a stupid name enough, Humpty Dumpty interrupted impatiently. What does it mean? Must a name mean something? Alice asked doubtfully. Of course it must, Humpty Dumpty said with a short laugh. My name means the shape I am, and a good handsome shape it is too. With a name like yours, you might be any shape, almost. Why do you sit out here all alone, said Alice, not wishing to begin an argument. Why, because there's nobody with me, cried Humpty Dumpty. Did you think I didn't know the answer to that? Ask another. Oh, don't you think it would be safer down on the ground, Alice went on, not with any idea of making another riddle, but simply in her good-natured anxiety for the queer creature. The wall is so very narrow. What tremendously easy riddles, you ask, Humpty Dumpty growled out. Of course I don't think so. Why, if ever I did fall off, which there's no chance of, but if I did... Here he pursed up his lips and looked so solemn and grand that Alice could hardly help laughing. If I did fall, he went on, the king has promised me... Ah, you may turn pale if you like. You didn't think I was going to say that, did you? The king has promised me with his own mouth to... to... to send all his horses and all his men, Alice interrupted rather unwisely. Now I declare that's too bad, Humpty Dumpty cried, breaking into a sudden passion. You've been listening at doors and behind trees and down chimneys, or you couldn't have known it. I haven't indeed, Alice said very gently. It's in a book. Ah, oh, well, they may write such things in a book, Humpty Dumpty said in a calmer tone. That's what you call a history of England, that is. Now take a good look at me. I'm one that has spoken to a king, I am. <laughs> Maybe you never see such another. And to show you I'm not proud, you may shake hands with me. And he grinned almost from ear to ear as he leant forward and as nearly as possible fell off the wall in doing so and offered Alice his hand. She watched him a little anxiously as she took it. If he smiled much more, the ends of his mouth might meet behind, she thought, and then I don't know what would happen to his head. I'm afraid it had come off. <laughs> yes, all his horses and all his men, Humpty Dumpty went on. They'd pick me up again in a minute, they would. However, this conversation is going on a little too fast. Let's get back to the last remark but one. I'm afraid I can't quite remember it, Alice said very politely. In that case, we may start fresh, said Humpty Dumpty, and it's my turn to choose a subject. He talks about it just as if it was a game, thought Alice. So here's a question for you. How old did you say you were? Alice made a short calculation and said, seven years and six months. Wrong, Humpty Dumpty exclaimed triumphantly. You never said a word like it. I thought you meant, how old are you, Alice explained. If I had meant that, I'd have said it, said Humpty Dumpty. Alice didn't want to begin another argument, so she said nothing. 
Seven years and six months, Humpty Dumpty repeated thoughtfully. An uncomfortable sort of age. Now, if you'd asked my advice, I'd have said leave off at seven. But it's too late now. I never ask advice about growing, Alice said indignantly. Too proud, the other inquired. Alice felt even more indignant at this suggestion. I mean, she said, that one can't help growing older. One can't, perhaps, said Humpty Dumpty, but two can. <laughs> With proper assistance, you might have left off at seven. What a beautiful belt you've got on, Alice suddenly remarked. At least, she corrected herself on second thoughts, uh, a beautiful cravat, I, I should have said. Uh, no, no, a belt, I, I mean. Oh, I beg your pardon, she added in dismay, for Humpty Dumpty looked thoroughly offended, and she began to wish she hadn't chosen that subject. If only I knew, she thought to herself, which was neck and which was waist. Evidently, Humpty Dumpty was very angry. Though he said nothing for a minute or two, when he did speak, it was in a deep growl. It is a most provoking thing, he said at last, when a person doesn't know a cravat from a belt. I know it's very ignorant of me, Alice replied, in so humble a tone that Humpty Dumpty relented. It's a cravat, child, and a beautiful one, as you say. It's a present from the white king and queen. There now. Is it really, said Alice, quite pleased to find she had chosen a good subject after all. They gave it me, Humpty Dumpty continued thoughtfully as he crossed one knee over the other and clasped his hands round it, for an unbirthday present. I beg your pardon, Alice said with a puzzled air. I'm not offended, said Humpty Dumpty. I mean, what is an unbirthday present? A present given when it isn't your birthday, of course. Alice considered a little. I like birthday presents best, she said at last. You don't know what you're talking about, cried Humpty Dumpty. How many days are there in a year? 365, said Alice. And how many birthdays have you? One. And if you take one from 365, what remains? 364, of course. I'd rather see that done on paper, he said. Alice couldn't help smiling. She took out her memorandum book and worked the sum out for him. Three, six, five, minus one, three, six, four. Humpty Dumpty took the book and looked at it very carefully. That seems to be done right, he began. You're holding it upside down, Alice interrupted. Oh, to be sure I was, Humpty Dumpty said gaily as she turned it round for him. I thought it looked a little queer. As I was saying, that seems to be done right though I haven't time to look it over thoroughly just now, and that shows that there are 364 days when you might get unbirthday presents. Certainly, said Alice, and only one for birthday presents, you know. There's glory for you. I don't know what you mean by glory, Alice said. Humpty Dumpty smiled contemptuously. Of course you don't, till I tell you. I meant there's a nice knock-down argument for you. But glory doesn't mean a nice knockdown argument, Alice objected. When I use a word, Humpty Dumpty said in a rather scornful tone, it means just what I choose it to mean, neither more nor less. You seem very clever at explaining words, sir, said Alice. Would you kindly tell me the meaning of the poem Jabberwocky? Let's hear it, said Humpty Dumpty. I can explain all the poems that ever were invented, and a good many that haven't been invented just yet. Sounded very hopeful, so Alice repeated the first verse. "'Twas brillig, and the slithy toves did gyre and gimble in the wave, all mimsy were the borogoves, and the moan wraths outgrave." "'That's enough to begin with,' Humpty Dumpty interrupted. "'There are plenty of hard words there. "'Brillig means four o'clock in the afternoon, the time when you begin broiling things for dinner.' That'll do very well, said Alice. And slithy? Well, slithy means lithe and slimy. Lithe is the same as active. You see, it's like a portmanteau. There are two meanings packed up into one word. I see it now, Alice remarked thoughtfully. And what are toves? Well, toves are something like badgers. 
They are something like lizards, and they are something like corkscrews. They must be very curious creatures. They are, that's it, Humpty Dumpty. Also, they make their nests under sundials. Also, they live on cheese. And what's Tagar and Tagimbu? Tagar is to go round and round like a gyroscope. Tagimbu is to make holes like a gimlet. And the wave is the grass plot round a sundial, I suppose, said Alice, surprised at her own ingenuity. Of course it is. It's called wave, you know, because it goes a long way before it and a long way behind it. <laughs> and a long way beyond it on each side, Alice added. Exactly so. Well, then Mimsy is flimsy and miserable. There's another portmanteau for you. And a borogove is a thin, shabby-looking bird with its feathers sticking out all round, something like a live mop. And then Moam Raths, said Alice, if I'm not giving you too much trouble. Well, a Rath is a sort of green pig. But Moam, I'm not certain about. I think it's short for from home, meaning that they'd lost their way, you know. And what does outgrave mean? Well, outdriving is something between bellowing and whistling, with a kind of sneeze in the middle. However, you'll hear it done, maybe, down in the wood yonder, and when you've once heard it, you'll be quite content. Who's been repeating all that hard stuff to you? I read it in a book, said Alice, but I had some poetry repeated to me much easier than that, by uh, Tweedledee, I think. As to poetry, you know, said Humpty Dumpty, stretching out one of his great hands, I can repeat poetry as well as other folk if it comes to that. Oh, it needn't come to that, Alice hastily said, hoping to keep him from beginning. The piece I'm going to repeat, he went on without noticing her remark, was written entirely for your amusement. Alice felt that in that case she really ought to listen to it, so she sat down and said, thank you, rather sadly. In winter, when the fields are white, I sing this song for your delight. Only I don't see it, he explained. I see you don't, said Alice. If you can see whether I am singing or not, you've sharper eyes than most, Humpty Dumpty remarked severely. Alice was silent. In spring, when woods are getting green, I'll try and tell you what I mean. Thank you very much, said Alice. In summer, when the days are long, perhaps you'll understand the song. In autumn, when the leaves are brown, take pen and ink and write it down. I will if I can remember it so long, said Alice. You needn't go on making remarks like that, Humpty Dumpty said. They're not sensible, and they put me out. I sent a message to the fish. I told them this is what I wish. The little fishes of the sea, they sent an answer back to me. The little fishes answer was, we cannot do it, sir, because... I'm afraid I don't quite understand, said Alice. It gets easier further on, Humpty Dumpty replied. I went to them again to say it will be better to obey. The fishes answered with a grin, why, what a temper you are in. I told them once, I told them twice, they would not listen to advice. I took a kettle large and new, fit for the deed I had to do. My heart went hop, my heart went thump, I filled the kettle at the pump. Then someone came to me and said, the little fishes are in bed. I said to him, I said it plain, then you must wake them up again. I said it very loud and clear, I went and shouted in his ear. Humpty Dumpty raised his voice almost to a scream as he repeated this verse, and Alice thought with a shudder I wouldn't have been the messenger for anything. But he was very stiff and proud. He said, you needn't shout so loud. And he was very proud and stiff. He said, I'd go and wake them if... I took a corkscrew from the shelf. I went to wake them up myself. And when I found the door was locked, I pulled and pushed and kicked and knocked. And when I found the door shut, I tried to turn the handle, but... There was a long pause. 
Is that all? Alice timidly asked. That's all, said Humpty Dumpty. Goodbye. This was rather sudden, Alice thought. But after such a very strong hint that she ought to be going, she felt it would hardly be civil to stay. So she held out her hand. Goodbye, till we meet again, she said, as cheerfully as she could. I shouldn't know you again if we did meet, Humpty Dumpty replied in a discontented tone, giving her one of his fingers to shake. You're so exactly like other people. Alice waited a minute to see if he'd speak again. But as he never took any further notice of her, she said goodbye once more, and in getting no answer to this, she quietly walked away. But she couldn't help saying to herself as she went, of all the unsatisfactory... She repeated this aloud, as it was a great comfort to have such a long word to say, of all the unsatisfactory people I ever met. She never finished the sentence, for at this moment a heavy crash shook the forest from end to end. <laughs> The next moment, soldiers came running through the wood, at first in twos and threes, then ten or twenty together, and at last in such crowds that they seemed to fill the whole forest. Alice got behind a tree for fear of being run over and watched them go by. She thought that in all her life she'd never seen soldiers so uncertain on their feet. They were always tripping over something or other, and whenever one went down, several more always fell over him so that the ground was covered with little heaps of men. Then came the horses. Having four feet, these managed rather better than the foot soldiers, but even they stumbled now and then, and it seemed to be a regular rule that whenever a horse stumbled, the rider fell off instantly. The confusion got worse every moment, and Alice was very glad to get into an open place where she found the White King, seated on the ground, busily writing in his memorandum book. I've sent them all, the king cried, in a tone of delight on seeing Alice. Did you happen to meet any soldiers, my dear, as you came through the wood? Yes, I did, said Alice. Several thousand, I should think. Four thousand two hundred and seven, that's the exact number, the king said, referring to his book. I couldn't send all the horses, you know, because two of them were wanted in the game. And I haven't sent the two messengers, either. They're both gone to the town. Just look along the road and tell me if you can see either of them. I can see nobody on the road, said Alice. I only wish I had such eyes, the king remarked in a fretful tone, to be able to see nobody, and at that distance too. Why, it's as much as I can do to see real people by this light. All this was lost on Alice, who was still looking intently along the road, shading her eyes with one hand. I see somebody now, she exclaimed at last, but he's coming very slowly, and what curious attitudes he gets into. For the messenger kept skipping up and down and wriggling like an eel as he came along with his great hands spread out like fans on each side. Not at all, said the king. He's an Anglo-Saxon messenger, and those are Anglo-Saxon attitudes. He only does them when he's happy. His name is Heyer. He pronounced it so as to rhyme with Maya. The other messenger is called Hatta. I must have two, you know, to come and go. One to come and one to go. I beg your pardon, said Alice. It isn't respectable to beg, said the king. I only meant that I didn't understand, said Alice. Why one to come and one to go? Don't I tell you, the king repeated impatiently, I must have two. 
to fetch and carry, one to fetch and one to carry. At this moment, the messenger arrived. He was far too much out of breath to say a word, and could only wave his hands about and make the most fearful faces at the poor king. You alarm me, said the king. I feel faint. Give me a ham sandwich. On which the messenger, to Alice's great amusement, opened a bag that hung round his neck and handed a sandwich to the king, who devoured it greedily. Another sandwich, said the king. There's nothing but hay left now, the messenger said, peeping into the bag. Hay, then, the king faintly murmured. Alice was glad to see that it revived him a good deal. There's nothing like eating hay when you're faint, he remarked to her as he munched away. I should think throwing cold water over you would be better, Alice suggested, or some sal volatile. I didn't say there was nothing better, the king replied. I said there was nothing like it which Alice did not venture to deny. Who did you pass on the road? The king went on, holding out his hand to the messenger for some more hay. Nobody, said the messenger. Quite right, said the king. This young lady saw him too. So, of course, nobody walks slower than you. I do my best, the messenger said in a sullen tone. I'm sure nobody walks much faster than I do. He can't do that, said the king, or else he'd have been here first. <laughs> However, now you've got your breath, you may tell us what's going on in the town. I'll whisper it, said the messenger, putting his hands to his mouth in the shape of a trumpet and stooping so as to get close to the king's ear. Alice was sorry for this, as she wanted to hear the news too. However, instead of whispering, he simply shouted at the top of his voice, There, at it again! Do you call that a whisper, cried the poor king, jumping up and shaking himself. If you do such a thing again, I'll have you buttered. It went through and through my head like an earthquake. It would have to be a very tiny earthquake, thought Alice. Who are at it again, she ventured to ask. Why, the lion and the unicorn, of course, said the king. Fighting for the crown? Yes, to be sure, said the king. And the best of the joke is that it's my crown all the time. <laughs> Let's run and see them. And they trotted off, Alice repeating to herself as she ran the words of the old song, The lion and the unicorn were fighting for the crown. The lion beat the unicorn all round the town. Some gave them white bread, and some gave them brown. Some gave them plum cake, and drummed them out of town. And uh, does... Does the one, the one that wins, you get the crown? She asked, as well as she could, for the long run was putting her quite out of breath. Dear me, no, said the king. What an idea. Well, would you uh, be good enough, uh, Alice panted out after running a little further, to stop a minute, j just to get one's breath. <laughs> I'm good enough, the king said, only I'm not strong enough. You see, a minute goes by so fearfully quick. You might as well try to stop a bandersnatch. Alice had no more breath for talking, so they trotted on in silence till they came in sight of a great crowd in the middle of which the lion and unicorn were fighting. They were in such a cloud of dust that at first Alice could not make out which was which, but she soon managed to distinguish the unicorn by its horn. They placed themselves close to where Hatter, the other messenger, was standing watching the fight with a cup of tea in one hand and a piece of bread and butter in the other. He's only just out of prison and he hadn't finished his tea when he was sent in, Hare whispered to Alice, and they only give them oyster shells in there. <laughs> so you see, he's very hungry and thirsty. How are you, dear child? He went on, putting his arm affectionately round Hatter's neck. Hatter looked round and nodded, and went on with his bread and butter. Were you happy in prison, dear child? said Hare. Hatter looked round once more, and this time a tear or two trickled down his cheek, but not a word would he say. Speak, can't you? Hare cried impatiently. But Hatter only munched away and drank some more tea. Speak, won't you, cried the king. How are they getting on with the fight? Hatter made a desperate effort and swallowed a large piece of bread and butter. They're getting on very well, he said in a choking voice. Each of them has been down about eighty-seven times. 
There was a pause in the fight just then, and the lion and the unicorn sat down panting while the king called out, Ten minutes allowed for refreshments. Hare and Hatter set to work at once, carrying round trays of white and brown bread. Alice took a piece to taste, but it was very dry. I don't think they'll fight any more today, the king said to Hatter. Go and order the drums to begin. And Hatter went bounding away like a grasshopper. For a minute or two, Alice stood silently watching him. Suddenly she brightened up. Look, look, she cried, pointing eagerly. There's the white queen running across the country. She came flying out of the wood over yonder. How fast those queens can run. There's some enemy after her, no doubt, the king said, without even looking round. That wood's full of them. But aren't you going to run and help her, Alice asked, very much surprised at his taking it so quietly. No use, no use, said the king. She runs so fearfully quick. You might as well try to catch a bandersnatch. At this moment, the unicorn sauntered by them with his hands in his pockets. I had the best of it this time, he said to the king, just glancing at him as he passed. A little, a little, said the king, rather nervously. You shouldn't have run him through with your horn, you know. It didn't hurt him, the unicorn said carelessly. And he was going on when his eye happened to fall upon Alice. He turned round instantly and stood for some time looking at her with an air of the deepest disgust. What is this? he said at last. This is a child, Heya replied eagerly coming in front of Alice to introduce her and spreading out both his hands towards her in an Anglo-Saxon attitude. We only found it today. It's for large as life and twice as natural. I always thought they were fabulous monsters, said the unicorn. Is it alive? It can talk, said Heya solemnly. The unicorn looked dreamily at Alice and said, Talk, child. Alice could not help her lips curling up into a smile as she began, Do you know, I've always thought unicorns were fabulous monsters, too. I never saw one alive before. Well, now that we have seen each other, said the unicorn, if you'll believe in me, I'll believe in you. Is that a bargain? Yes, if you like, said Alice. Come fetch out the plum cake, old man, the unicorn went on, turning from her to the king. None of your brown bread for me. Certainly, certainly, the king muttered and beckoned to hair. Open the bag, he whispered. Quick, not that one, that's full of hay. Hare took a large cake out of the bag and gave it to Alice to hold while he got out a dish and a carving knife. How they all came out of it, Alice couldn't guess. It was just like a conjuring trick, she thought. The lion had joined them while this was going on. He looked very tired and sleepy, and his eyes were half shut. What's this, he said, blinking lazily at Alice and speaking in a deep, hollow tone that sounded like the tolling of a great bell. Ah, what is it now, the unicorn cried eagerly. You'll never guess. I couldn't. The lion looked at Alice wearily. Ah, you animal. Oh, vegetable. Oh, mineral, he said yawning at every other word. It's a fabulous monster, the unicorn cried out before Alice could reply. Then hand round the plum cake monster, the lion said, lying down and putting his chin on his paws. And sit down, both of you, to the king and the unicorn. Fair play with the cake, you know. The king was evidently very uncomfortable at having to sit down between the two great creatures, but there was no other place for him. What a fight we might have for the crown now, the unicorn said, looking slyly up at the crown, which the poor king was nearly shaking off his head. He trembled so much. Alice had seated herself on the bank of a little brook with the great dish on her knees and was sawing away diligently with the knife. It's very provoking, she said in reply to the lion. I've cut off several slices already, but they will always join on again. You don't know how to manage looking glass cakes, the unicorn remarked. Hand it round first and cut it afterwards. This sounded nonsense, but Alice very obediently got up and carried the dish round, and the cake divided itself into three pieces as she did so. 
Now cut it up, said the lion, as she returned to her place with the empty dish. I say, this isn't fair, cried the unicorn, as Alice sat with the knife in her hand, very much puzzled how to begin. The monster's given the lion twice as much as me. She's kept none for herself, anyhow, said the lion. Do you like plum cake, monster? But before Alice could answer him, the drums began. Where the noise came from, she couldn't make out. The air seemed full of it, and it rang through and through her head till she felt quite deafened. She started to her feet, and in her terror she sprang across the brook and had just time to see the lion and unicorn rise to their feet with angry looks at being interrupted in their feast before she dropped to her knees and put her hands over her ears, vainly trying to shut out the dreadful uproar. If that doesn't drum them out of town, she thought to herself, nothing ever will. Chapter 7, It's My Own Invention. At this moment, her thoughts were interrupted by a loud shouting of Ahoy! Ahoy! Check! And a knight, dressed in crimson armour, came galloping down upon her, brandishing a great club. Just as he reached her, the horse stopped suddenly. You're my prisoner! the knight cried as he tumbled off his horse. Startled as she was, Alice was more frightened for him than for herself at the moment, and watched him with some anxiety as he mounted again. As soon as he was comfortably in the saddle, he began once more, You're my... But here another voice broke in, Ahoy! Ahoy! Check! And Alice looked round in some surprise for the new enemy. This time it was a white knight. He drew up at Alice's side and tumbled off his horse just as the Red Knight had done. Then he got on again, and the two knights sat and looked at each other without speaking. Alice looked from one to the other in some bewilderment. She's my prisoner, you know, the Red Knight said at last. Yes, but then I came and rescued her, the White Knight replied. Well, we must fight for her then, said the Red Knight as he took up his helmet, which hung from the saddle and was something in the shape of a horse's head, and put it on. You will observe the rules of battle, of course, the white knight remarked, putting on his helmet too. I always do, said the red knight, and they began banging away at each other with such fury that Alice got behind a tree to be out of the way of the blows. I wonder now what the rules of battle are, she said to herself as she watched the fight, timidly peeping out from her hiding place. One rule seems to be that if one knight hits the other, he knocks him off his horse, and if he misses, he tumbles off himself. And another rule seems to be that they hold their clubs in their arms, as if they were Punch and Judy. Another rule of battle that Alice had not noticed seemed to be that they always fell on their heads, and the battle ended with their both falling off in this way, side by side. When they got up again, they shook hands, and then the Red Knight mounted and galloped off. It was a glorious victory, wasn't it, said the White Knight as he came up panting. I don't know, Sir Alice said doubtfully. 
I don't want to be anybody's prisoner. I want to be a queen. So you will when you cross the next brook, said the white knight. I'll see you safe to the end of the wood, and then I must go back, you know. That's the end of my move. Thank you very much, said Alice. May I help you off with your helmet? It was evidently more than he could manage by himself. However, she managed to shake him out of it at last. Oh, now one can breathe more easily, said the knight, putting back his shaggy hair with both hands and turning his gentle face and large, mild eyes to Alice. She thought she'd never seen such a strange-looking soldier in all her life. He was dressed in tin armour, which seemed to fit him very badly, and he had a queer little deal box fastened across his shoulders upside down, and with the lid hanging open. Alice looked at it with great curiosity. I see you're admiring my little box, the knight said in a friendly tone. It's my own invention to keep clothes and sandwiches in. You see, I carry it upside down so that the rain can't get in. But the things can get out, Alice gently remarked. Do you know the lid's open? I didn't know it, the knight said, a shade of vexation passing across his face. Then all the things must have fallen out. And the box is no use without them. He unfastened it as he spoke, and was just going to throw it into the bushes, when a sudden thought seemed to strike him, and he hung it carefully on a tree. Can you guess why I did that? he said to Alice. Alice shook her head. In hope some bees may make a nest in it, then I should get the honey. You see, he went on after a pause, it's as well to be provided for everything. That's the reason the horse has got anklets round his feet. But what are they for? Alice asked in a tone of great curiosity. To guard against the bites of sharks, the knight replied. It's an invention of my own. I hope you've got your hair well fastened on, he continued as they set off. Well, only in the usual way, Alice said, smiling. That's hardly enough, he said anxiously. You see, the wind is so very strong here. It's as strong as soup. Have you invented a plan for keeping one's hair from being blown off? Alice inquired. Not yet, said the knight. But I've got a plan for keeping it from falling off. I should like to hear it very much. First, you take an upright stick, said the knight. Then you make your hair creep up it like a fruit tree. Now, the reason hair falls off is because it hangs down. Things never fall upward, you know. It's my own invention. You may try it if you like. It didn't sound a comfortable plan, Alice thought, and for a few minutes she walked on in silence, puzzling over the idea and every now and then stopping to help the poor knight, who certainly was not a good rider. Whenever the horse stopped, which he did very often, he fell off in front, and whenever it went on again, which he generally did rather suddenly, he fell off behind. Otherwise, he kept on pretty well, except that he had a habit of now and then falling off sideways, and as he generally did this on the side on which Alice was walking, she soon found that it was the best plan not to walk quite close to the horse. The great art of riding, the knight suddenly began in a loud voice, waving his arm as he spoke, is to keep... Here the sentence ended as suddenly as it had begun, as the knight fell heavily on the top of his head, exactly in the path where Alice was walking. She was quite frightened this time, and said in an anxious tone as she picked him up, I hope no bones are broken. None to speak of, the knight said, as if he didn't mind breaking two or three of them. The great art of riding, as I was saying, is to keep your balance. Like this, you know. He let go the bridle and stretched out both his arms to show Alice what he meant, and this time he fell flat on his back, right under the horse's feet. It's too ridiculous, said Alice, getting quite out of patience. You ought to have a wooden horse on wheels, that you ought. Does that kind go smoothly? The knight asked in a tone of great interest, clasping his arms round the horse's neck as he spoke, just in time to save himself from tumbling off again. Much more smoother than a live horse, Alice said, with a little scream of laughter in spite of all she could do to prevent it. I'll get one, the knight said thoughtfully to himself. One or two, several. 
There was a short silence after this. Then the knight went on again. I am a great hand at inventing things. Now I dare say you noticed the last time you picked me up that I was looking thoughtful. You were a little grave, said Alice. Well, just then I was inventing a new way of getting over a gate. Would you like to hear it? Very much indeed, Alice said politely. I'll tell you how I came to think of it, said the knight. You see, I said to myself, the only difficulty is with the feet. The head is high enough already. Now first I put my head on the top of the gate. Then the head's high enough. Then I stand on my head. Then the feet are high enough, you see. And then I, I'm over, you see. <laughs> Yes, I suppose you would be over when that was done, Alice said thoughtfully. But don't you think it'd be rather hard? I haven't tried it yet, the knight said gravely, so I can't tell for certain. But I'm afraid it would be a little hard. Alice could only look puzzled. You are sad, the knight said in an anxious tone. Let me tell you a tale to comfort you. Is it very long, Alice asked, for she'd heard a good deal of poetry that day. It is long, said the knight. But it's very, very beautiful. Everybody that hears me tell it, either it brings tears into their eyes, or else... Or else what, said Alice, for the knight had made a sudden pause. Or else it doesn't, you know. <laughs> so saying, he stopped his horse and let the reins fall on its neck. Then, slowly beating time with one hand and with a faint smile lighting up his gentle, foolish face, he began. Of all the strange things that Alice saw in her journey through the looking-glass, this was the one that she always remembered most clearly. Years afterwards, she could bring the whole scene back again, as if it had been only yesterday. The mild blue eyes and kindly smile of the night, the setting sun gleaming through his hair and shining on his armour in a blaze of light that quite dazzled her, the horse quietly moving about, with the reins hanging loose on his neck, cropping the grass at her feet, and the black shadows of the forest behind, all this she took in like a picture, as, with one hand shading her eyes, she leant against a tree, watching the strange pair, and listening in a half-dream to the melancholy tale. I'll tell thee everything I can. There's little to relate. I saw an aged, aged man a sitting on a gate. Who are you, aged man, I said, and how is it you live? And his answer trickled through my head like water through a sieve. He said, I look for butterflies that sleep among the wheat. I make them into mutton pies and sell them in the street. I sell them unto men, he said, who sail on stormy seas. And that's the way I get my bread, a trifle, if you please. But I was thinking of a plan to dye one's whiskers green, and always use so large a fan that they could not be seen. So, having no reply to give to what the old man said, I cried, come, tell me how you live, and thumped him on the head. His accents mild took up the tale. He said, I go my ways, and when I find the mountain rill, I set it in a blaze. And thence they make a stuff they call Roland's Macassar oil, yet tuppence halfpenny is all they give me for my toil. But I was thinking of a way to feed oneself on better, and so go on from day to day getting a little fatter. I shook him well from side to side until his face was blue. Come tell me how you live, I cried, and what it is you do. He said, I hunt for haddock's eyes among the heather bright, and work them into waistcoat buttons in the silent night. And these I do not sell for gold, or coin of silvery shine, but for a copper halfpenny, and that will purchase nine. I sometimes dig for buttered rolls, or set lime twigs for crabs. I sometimes search the grassy knolls for wheels of handsome cabs. And that's the way, he gave a wink, by which I get my wealth. And very gladly will I drink your honour's noble health. 
I heard him then, for I had just completed my design to keep the many I bridge from rust by boiling it in wine. I thanked him much for telling me the way he got his wealth, and chiefly for his wish that he might drink my noble health. And now, if e'er by chance I put my fingers into glue, or madly squeeze a right hand foot into a left hand shoe, or if I drop upon my toe a very heavy weight, I weep, for it reminds me so of that old man I used to know, whose look was mild, whose speech was slow, whose hair was whiter than the snow, whose face was very like a crow, with eyes like cinders all aglow, who seemed distracted with his woe, who rocked his body to and fro, and muttered mumblingly and low, as if his mouth were full of dough, who snorted like a buffalo that summer evening long ago, a sitting on a gate. As the knight spoke the last words of the ballad, he gathered up the reins and turned his horse's head along the road by which they'd come. You've only a few yards to go, he said, down the hill and over that little brook, and then you'll be a queen. But you'll stay and see me off first, he added, as Alice turned away with an eager look. I shan't be long. You'll wait and wave your handkerchief when I get to that turn in the road. I think it'll encourage me, you see. Of course I'll wait, said Alice, and thank you very much for coming so far, and for the ballad. I liked it very much. I hope so, the knight said doubtfully, but you didn't cry so much as I expected. So they shook hands, and then the knight rode slowly away into the forest. It won't take long to see him off, I expect, Alice said to herself as she watched the horse walking leisurely along the road, and the knight tumbling off, first on one side and then on the other, after the fourth or fifth tumble, he reached the turn, and then she waved her handkerchief to him and waited till he was out of sight. I hope it encouraged him, she said, as she turned to run down the hill. And now for the last brook, and to be a queen, how grand it sounds. A very few steps brought her to the edge of the brook. The eighth square at last, she cried, as she bounded over and threw herself down to rest on a lawn as soft as moss with little flower beds dotted all about it here and there. Oh, how glad I am to get here. And what is this on my head? She exclaimed in a tone of dismay as she put her hands up to something very heavy that fitted tight round her head. But how can it have got there without my knowing it? She said to herself as she lifted it off and set it on her lap to make out what it could possibly be. It was a golden crown.
chapter 8, Queen Alice. Everything was happening so oddly that she didn't feel a bit surprised at finding the Red Queen and the White Queen sitting close to her, one on each side. She would have liked very much to ask them how they came there, but she feared it would not be quite civil. However, there would be no harm, she thought, in asking if the game were over. Please, would you tell me, she began, looking timidly at the Red Queen. Speak when you're spoken to, the Red Queen sharply interrupted her. But if everybody obeyed that rule, said Alice, who was always ready for a little argument, and if you only spoke when you were spoken to, and the other person always waited for you to begin, you see nobody would ever say anything. So that ridiculous, cried the Queen. Why don't you see, child? Here she broke off with a frown, and after thinking for a minute, suddenly changed the subject of the conversation. What do you mean by if you really are a queen? What right have you to call yourself so? You can't be a queen, you know, till you've passed the proper examination. And the sooner we begin it, the better. I'm sure I didn't mean Alice was beginning, but the Red Queen interrupted. That's just what I complain of. You should have meant. What do you suppose is the use of a child without any meaning? Even a joke should have some meaning, and a child's more important than a joke, I hope. You couldn't deny that even if you tried with both hands. I don't deny things with my hands, Alice objected. Nobody said you did, said the Red Queen. I said you couldn't if you tried. She's in that state of mind, said the White Queen, that she wants to deny something, only she doesn't know what to deny. A nasty, vicious temper, the Red Queen remarked, and then there was an uncomfortable silence for a minute or two. The Red Queen broke the silence by saying to the White Queen, I invite you to Alice's dinner party this afternoon. The White Queen smiled feebly and said, And I invite you. I didn't know I was to have a party at all, said Alice, but if there is to be one, I think I ought to invite the guests. We gave you the opportunity of doing it, the Red Queen remarked, but I dare say you've not had many lessons in manners yet. Manners are not taught in lessons, said Alice. Lessons teach you to do sums and things of that sort. Can you do addition, the White Queen asked. What's one and 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 one? I don't know, said Alice. I've lost count. She can't do addition, the Red Queen interrupted. Can you do subtraction? Take nine from eight. Nine from eight? I can't, you know, Alice replied very readily. But she can't do sums a bit, the Queen said together with great emphasis. Can you do sums, Alice said, turning suddenly on the White Queen, for she didn't like being found fault with so much. The, the Queen gasped and shut her eyes. I, I, I can do addition, she said, if you give me time. But, but I can't do subtraction under any circumstances. The Red Queen began again. Can you answer useful questions, she asked. How is bread made? I know that, Alice cried eagerly. You take some flour. Where do you pick the flour, the White Queen asked. In a garden or in the hedges? Well, it isn't picked at all, Alice explained. It's ground. How many acres of ground, said the White Queen. You mustn't leave out so many things. Fan her head, the Red Queen anxiously interrupted. She'll be feverish after so much thinking. So they set to work and fanned her with bunches of leaves till she had to beg them to leave off. It blew her hair about so. She's all right again now, said the Red Queen. Do you know languages? What's the French for fiddle-de-dee? Fiddle-de-dee is not English, Alice replied gravely. Who said it was, said the Red Queen. Alice thought she saw a way out of the difficulty this time. If you'll tell me what language fiddle-de-dee is, I'll tell you the French for it, she exclaimed triumphantly. But the Red Queen drew herself up rather stiffly and said, Queens never make bargains. I wish queens never ask questions, Alice thought to herself. Don't let us quarrel, the White Queen said in an anxious tone. What is the cause of lightning? The cause of lightning, Alice said very decidedly, for she felt quite sure about this, is the thunder. No, no, she hastily corrected herself. I meant the other way. It's too late to correct it, said the Red Queen. When you once said a thing, that fixes it, and you must take the consequences. We had such a thunderstorm last Tuesday. 
Humpty Dumpty, so I too, the White Queen went on in a low voice, more as if she were talking to herself. He came to the door with a corkscrew in his hand. What for, said the Red Queen? He said he would come in, the White Queen went on, because he was looking for a hippopotamus. Now, as it happened, there wasn't such a thing in the house that morning. Is there generally? Alice asked in an astonished tone. Well, only on Thursdays, said the Queen. The White Queen gave a deep sigh and laid her head on Alice's shoulder. I am so sleepy, she moaned. She's tired, poor thing, said the Red Queen. Smooth her hair, lend her your nightcap, and sing her a soothing lullaby. I haven't got a nightcap with me, said Alice, as she tried to obey the first direction, and I don't know any soothing lullabies. I must do it myself then, said the Red Queen, and she began, hush a lady, in Alice's lap, till the feast's ready, we've time for a nap. When the feast's over, we'll go to the ball, Red Queen and White Queen and Alice and all. And now you know the words, she added, as she put her head down on Alice's other shoulder, just sing it through to me, I'm getting sleepy too. In another moment, both queens were fast asleep and snoring loud. The snoring got more distinct every minute and sounded more like a tune. At last she could even make out words, and she listened so eagerly that when the two great heads suddenly vanished from her lap, she hardly missed them. She was standing before an arched doorway, over which were the words Queen Alice in large letters, and on each side of it there was a bell handle. One marked Visitor's Bell, and the other's Servant's Bell. I'll wait till the song's over, thought Alice, and then I'll ring the, the, which bell must I ring, she went on, very much puzzled by the names. I mean, I'm not a visitor, and I'm not a servant. There ought to be one, marked Queen, you know. Just then the door opened a little way, and a creature with a long beak put its head out for a moment and said, no admittance till the week after next, and shut the door again with a bang. Alice knocked and rang in vain for a long time, but at last a very old frog, who was sitting under a tree, got up and hobbled slowly towards her. He was dressed in bright yellow and had enormous boots on. What is it now? the frog said in a deep, hoarse whisper. Alice turned round, ready to find fault with anybody. Where's the servant whose business it is to answer the door? she began. Which door? said the frog. Alice almost stamped with irritation at the slow drawl in which he spoke. This door, of course. The frog looked at the door with its large, dull eyes for a minute. Then he went nearer and rubbed it with his thumb, as if he were trying whether the paint would come off. Then he looked at Alice. To answer a door, he said, what's it been asking of? He was so hoarse that Alice could scarcely hear him. I don't know what you mean, she said. I speak English, doesn't I? The frog went on. Or are you deaf? What did it ask you? Nothing, Alice said impatiently. I've been knocking at it. Shouldn't do that, shouldn't do that, said the frog, muttering. Wex is it, you know. Then he went up and gave the door a kick with one of his great feet. You let it alone, he panted out as he hobbled back to his tree, and then it'll let you alone. <laughs> At this moment, the door was flung open, and a shrill voice was heard singing, To the looking-glass world it was Alice that said, I have a scepter in hand, I have a crown on my head. Let the looking-glass creatures, wherever they be, come and dine with the Red Queen, the White Queen, and me. And hundreds of voices joined in the chorus. Then fill up the glasses as quick as you can, and sprinkle the table with buttons and bran. Put cats in the coffee and mice in the tea, and welcome Queen Alice with thirty times three. There followed a confused noise of cheering, and the same shrill voice sang another verse. O oh, looking glass creatures, quoth Alice, draw near. Tis an honour to see me, a favour to hear. Tis a privilege high to have dinner and tea, along with the Red Queen, the White Queen, and me. Then came the chorus again. 
Then fill up the glasses with treacle and ink, and anything else that is pleasant to drink. Mix sand with the cider, and wool with the wine, and welcome Queen Alice with ninety times nine. Ninety times nine, Alice repeated in despair. Oh, that'll never be done. I'd better go in at once. And in she went, and there was a dead silence the moment she appeared. Alice glanced nervously along the table. She walked up the large hall and noticed that there were about fifty guests of all kinds. Some were animals, some birds, and there were even a few flowers among them. I'm glad they've come without waiting to be asked, she thought. I should never have known who were the right people to invite. There were three chairs at the head of the table. The red and white queens had taken two of them, but the middle one was empty. Alice sat down rather uncomfortable at the silence and longing for someone to speak. At last the Red Queen began. You've missed the soup and fish, she said. Put on the joint. And the waiter set a leg of mutton before Alice, who looked at it rather anxiously, as she'd never had to carve one before. You look a little shy. Let me introduce you to that leg of mutton, said the Red Queen. Alice, mutton, mutton, Alice. The leg of mutton got up in the dish and made a little bow to Alice, and she returned the bow, not knowing whether to be frightened or amused. May I give you a slice, she said, taking up the knife and fork and looking from one queen to the other. Certainly not, the Red Queen said very decidedly. It isn't etiquette to cut anyone you've been introduced to. Remove the joint. And the waiters carried it off and brought a large plum pudding in its place. I won't be introduced to the pudding, please, Alice said rather hastily, or we shall get no dinner at all. May I give you some? But the Red Queen looked sulky and growled, Pudding, Alice, Alice, pudding, remove the pudding. And the waiters took it away before Alice could return its vow. However, she didn't see why the Red Queen should be the only one to give orders, so as an experiment she called out, Waiter, bring back the pudding. And there it was again in a moment, like a conjuring trick. It was so large that she couldn't help feeling a little shy with it, as she had been with the mutton. However, she conquered her shyness by a great effort and handed a slice to the Red Queen. What impertinence, said the pudding. I wonder how you'd like it if I were to cut a slice out of you, you creature. Alice could only look at it and gasp. Make a remark, said the Red Queen. It's ridiculous to leave all the conversation to the pudding. Do you know, I've had such a quantity of poetry repeated to me today, Alice began, a little frightened at finding that the moment she opened her lips there was dead silence and all eyes were fixed upon her. And it's a very curious thing, I think. Every poem was about fishes in some way. Do you know why they're so fond of fishes all about here? She spoke to the Red Queen, whose answer was a little wide of the mark. As to fishes, she said, very slowly and solemnly, putting her mouth close to Alice's ear. Her white majesty knows a lovely riddle, all in poetry, all about fishes. Shall she repeat it? Her red majesty is very kind to mention it, the white queen murmured into Alice's other ear in a voice like the cooing of a pigeon. It would be such a treat. May I? Please do, Alice said very politely. The White Queen laughed with delight and stroked Alice's cheek. Then she began, First the fish must be caught. That is easy. A baby, I think, could have caught it. Next the fish must be bought. That is easy. A penny, I think, would have bought it. Now cook me the fish. That is easy. It will not take more than a minute. Let it lie in a dish. That is easy because it already is in it. Bring it here, let me sup. It is easy to set such a dish on the table. Take the dish cover up. Ah, that is so hard that I fear I am unable. For it holds it like glue. Holds the lid to the dish while it lies in the middle. <laughs> Which is easiest to do? Undish cover the fish or dish cover the riddle. Take a minute to think about it and then guess, said the Red Queen. Meanwhile, we'll drink your health. 
Queen Alice's health, she screamed at the top of her voice. And all the guests began drinking it directly, and very queerly they managed it. You ought to return thanks in a neat speech, the Red Queen said, frowning at Alice as she spoke. We must support you, you know, the White Queen whispered, as Alice got up to do it, very obediently, but a little frightened. Thank you very much, she whispered in reply, but I can do quite well without. That wouldn't be at all the thing, the Red Queen said very decidedly. So Alice tried to submit to it with a good grace. But they did push so, she said afterwards, when she was telling her sister the history of the feast. You would have thought they wanted to squeeze me flat. In fact, it was rather difficult for her to keep in her place when she made her speech. The two queens pushed her so, one on each side, that they nearly lifted her up into the air. I rise to return thanks, Alice began, and she really did rise as she spoke, several inches. But she got hold of the edge of the table and managed to pull herself down again. <laughs> Take care of yourself, screamed the White Queen, seizing Alice's hair with both her hands. Something's going to happen. And then, as Alice afterwards described it, all sorts of things happened in a moment. The candles all grew up to the ceiling, looking something like a bed of rushes with fireworks at the top. As to the bottles, they each took a pair of plates, which they hastily fitted on as wings, and so, with forks for legs, went fluttering about. And very like birds they look, Alice thought to herself, as well as she could, in the dreadful confusion that was beginning. At that moment she heard a horse laugh at her side, and turning to see what was the matter with the White Queen, instead of the Queen, there was the leg of mutton sitting in the chair. Here I am, cried a voice from the soup tureen, and Alice turned again, just in time to see the Queen's broad, good-natured face grinning at her for a moment over the edge of the tureen before she disappeared into the soup. There was not a moment to be lost. Already several of the guests were lying down in the dishes, and the soup ladle was walking up the table to Alice and signing to her to get out of its way. I can't stand this any longer, she cried, as she seized the tablecloth with both hands. One good pull, and plates, dishes, guests, and candles came crashing down together in a heap on the floor. And as for you, she went on, turning fiercely upon the Red Queen, whom she considered as the cause of all the mischief, but the Queen was no longer at her side. She'd suddenly dwindled down to the size of a little doll and was now on the table, merrily running round and round after her own shawl, which was trailing behind her. At any other time, Alice would have felt surprised at this, but she was far too much excited to be surprised at anything now. As for you, she repeated, catching hold of the little creature in the very act of jumping over a bottle which had just lighted upon the table, I'll shake you into a kitten, that I will. She took her off the table as she spoke, and shook her backwards and forwards with all her might. The Red Queen made no resistance whatever, only her face grew very small, and her eyes got large and green, and still, as Alice went on shaking her, she kept on growing shorter and fatter and softer and rounder, and it really was a kitten after all. A boat beneath a sunny sky, lingering onward dreamily in an evening of July. Children three that nestle near, eager eye and willing ear, pleased a simple tale to hear. Long has paled that sunny sky, echoes fade and memories die, autumn frosts have slain July. Still, she haunts me phantom-wise, 
palace moving under skies never seen by waking eyes. Children yet, the tale to hear, eager eye and willing ear, lovingly shall nestle near. In a wonderland they lie, dreaming as the days go by, dreaming as the summers die, ever drifting down the stream, lingering in the golden gleam. Now, what is it but a dream?